All right, it's great to be in chapel today. It's good to see each one of you. We thank the Lord for a little bit of uh, spring warmth, perhaps outside today. Praise the Lord for that. We're close. We're close. We'll just hang in there. Weather's going to break, and uh, we'll see flowers begin to bloom. And, uh, boy, just make us long for the beauty of heaven. Amen. Well, today we'll save our chapel speaker introduction for uh, here in just a, a few moments with Dr. Goodman, who will bring that in between the singing and the preaching. But uh, with that said, today we do have heavy hearts for some of our campus family. We understand um, that Jacob uh, Schaffner has had a death in his family. We pray for him. Uh, for Adrena Bader, we pray for her as well, death in her family. And then for Dr. Burton, his father-in-law uh, passed away as well. And so we pray uh, for those in our campus family who are experiencing uh, grief in this time. Of course, we don't grieve as those who have no hope. Our hope and confidence is in the Lord through the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so be mindful to pray for them. If you get a chance, uh, be sure to encourage each one of them as well. I know there are probably other unspoken requests today, and so the Lord knows those needs. Let's pray together, and then we'll worship the Lord. Heavenly Father, we do praise you and we thank you that you are the giver of life, and Lord, that you have provided for us eternal life through your Son, our Savior. Lord, we pray that you would just comfort, Father, those among our family of faith who are experiencing loss in this season. May you wrap them in your loving arms, and may they experience a peace that surpasseth all understanding. Father, fill the void that they're experiencing in this moment with the passing of their loved one, Lord, with your presence. And, Lord, may you, by your power, just minister uh, to them. Uh, Father, we pray you bring healing to those who are sick today. Lord, we pray for salvation for those who are lost, that you would convict them by your Holy Spirit, bring them to faith in Christ, that they would believe and be born again before it's everlasting too late. Speak to us today. Bless the preaching of your word. Encourage your preacher. We pray in Jesus' name. All God's people said. Amen. Well, good morning, Clear Creek. And guests, would you stand with me as we sing a new hymn together? gospel on which I stand for all eternity. It is my story, my Father's plan. The Son has rescued me. Oh, what a gospel, oh, what a peace, my highest joy and my deepest need. Now and forever he is my life. I stand in the gospel of Jesus Christ. There is one gospel to which I cling, all else I count as loss. For there where justice and mercy meet, he saved me on the cross. No more I boast in what I Christ. There is one gospel where hope is found, the empty tomb still speaks. For death could not keep my Savior down, he lives and I am free. Now on my Savior I fix my eyes, my is his and his hope is mine for he has promised i too will rise i stand in the gospel of jesus christ and in this gospel the church is one we do not walk alone we have his spirit as we press on to lead us safely home. And when in glory still I will sing of this old story that rescued me. Praise to my Savior, the King of life. I stand in 
the gospel of Jesus Christ. And when in glory still I will sing of this old story that rescued me. Praise to my Savior, the King of life. I stand in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Praise to my Savior, the King of life. I stand in the gospel of Jesus Christ. I stand in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. Give him praise for that gospel, church. Thank you, Lord. enter into our time of prayer and ask you all to be seated. After our time of prayer, we're going to sing a new song for you called Jesus Only Jesus. So in these moments of preparing our hearts, I ask during this time of prayer, focus on Jesus and how he is the one who sustains. He is the one that gives life. He is the one that gets us up every morning with every breath that we breathe. So join me now as we pray to our Savior. Gracious Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning. And Lord, as we just got done singing about how you're our solid rock, the firm foundation, and that your gospel is the only gospel, the gospel which brings life to us. Lord, once again, I pray we never just sing songs just to sing them, but we sing them to reflect on your gloriousness and, Lord, your wonder and your majesty. And, God, we do it to worship you and honor you in spirit and truth. And so, Lord, as we continue in this time of worship today, help all of us be focused on Jesus. Let distractions fade from our minds. Let us forget about what day it is, what time it is, what's coming up later. Lord, help us right now in this moment join the saints that are around your throne in worshiping you, singing holy, holy, holy is Lord God Almighty. So bless us now as we continue in this time of worship. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 
Most gracious Heavenly Father, how we pray that song brings you praise, God. Thinking of the angels and saints adoring you, God. And we have the honor of being saved by your blood so that we can join with them singing. God, I thank you so much, Lord, for the opportunities that we have to glorify you through music and through the word. And Lord, now as Dr. Goodman comes to introduce John, Lord, I just pray you come upon him boldly. Lord, let John come as confidently as he leads us in worship and music to come lead through worship in your word. And we give you all the glory and honor and praise for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Jesus, only Jesus. Amen. So thankful for that song. And John, thank you for giving me the privilege of introducing you today. I love students. That's no... Uh, news bulletin around here. I'm thankful for our students. I'm uh, student-centered. And God allows us sometimes to just knit a unique relationship uh, that's symbiotic, I think, both for the professor and uh, for the student, both for the administrator and the student. And we learn from each other and pour into each other. And uh, I'm thankful to, uh, through the years to be able to put many students on that list. One of those is John Foster. 
I remember, John, when you first came, and I remember uh, having you in New Testament 1, and I always ask new students, what's God called you to do? And John was pretty sure in that class that God had not called him to preach. Now, after about three weeks in, I was pretty sure that God had called John to preach, but <laughs> I determined that I would allow the Lord to, uh, to communicate that to John, and I wouldn't. And a little bit of time goes by. My memory, my recollection of it, John, may not be accurate, but it seems like it was a year or so. And I remember you announced in a cl- had made an announcement in a class. He said, uh, I want you all to know that it's been confirmed. The Lord's confirmed he's called me to preach. And I kind of chuckled. And I said, John, I've known that since the first day I met you, that God had called you to preach. I'm thankful for that. But, John, as I, I think about how the Lord led you from there to here, I think that there's a biblical character and a story that's always reminded me of you. And, and ever since I've known you the last four years or so, this story has reminded me of you. And I want to share that in, in just a moment. But John Foster is a legacy student. Uh, both his mother and father, Miss Leslie and Brother Jeff, are graduates of Clear Creek and uh, always excited to see legacy students come back. John might say that his greatest le- legacy was Mary and Maddie. Um, but uh, we are so excited to have John and Maddie on our campus and, and pray for them uh, as they are newlyweds. But in 1 Samuel chapter 16, this is what's always reminded me of John, and I've thought about this over the, the past couple of years. If you remember there, um, the Lord's going to speak to Samuel. He's going to tell him to go to Bethlehem, and he's going to anoint a king, and uh, he goes uh, before Jesse. He's sent there. And finally, he gets to David, and David is anointed as king. And then it's kind of like, okay, Lord, how are you going to work this story out? How are you going to get David from serving among the sheep to being the shepherd of a nation? And we see that God's going to move in the life of King Saul as well. We find that an evil spirit's going to come upon him. And then in verse 17, the Bible says this. You'll have to bear with me. I forgot my glasses in my office, so I'll have to lean back a little bit to be able to read it this morning. But the Bible says, So Saul said to his servants, Provide for me now a man who can play well and bring him to me. Then one of the young men said, Behold, I've seen a son of Jesse, the Bethlehemite, who is a skillful musician, a mighty man of valor, a warrior, one prudent in speech, and a handsome man, and the Lord is with him. And the Lord used that. The Lord used David's ability to play well on the harp to get him to where he needed to be. And you guys know the remainder of that story. But, John, I want to remind you that just as the Bible says of David that he was a skillful musician, you are. God's gifted you that way. And he's gifted you uniquely so he can use you specifically. I believe that the Lord has placed his gift upon you to be prudent in speech. And we're going to see that in just a moment. I'm excited to be fed um, by you as the Lord feeds us through you this morning, his word. But the Bible also tells us about David here that he was a mighty man of valor. And John, you've lived up to being a, a man of valor and you're continuing to grow in that. And my prayer is that you continue to walk so that one day after a while, when this life is over, that folks will say about you, and I pray that for me, that we've lived a life of valor for our Lord. And then the Bible says about David here that he was a warrior. And we know that David was gifted in battle, and none of us want to think about a battle or having to be a warrior. But John, just assuredly, as the Lord has called you, there is an enemy that wants to inhibit you. There's an enemy that wants to derail you and distract you and discourage you and discredit you. And you'll have to learn to be a warrior on your face before God, a warrior in his word, and a warrior as you walk with him in order to fulfill God's call upon your life. I'm proud of you, John. Thankful that you've come to this accomplishment. It's a testimony that it can be done, guys, that you can make it through four years here, and there is light at the end of the tunnel. So, John, if you'll come, I'd like to pray with you before you preach this morning. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you so much for John. I thank you for your call upon his life. Lord, I thank you that uh, in your providence, Lord, that uh, he was born when he was, to whom he was, and, Lord, that you have... Uh, united uh, him and Miss Maddie and Father that you've solidified this call upon his life and Lord ultimately this call upon their lives 
So, Father, this morning as we celebrate uh, his senior chapel, uh, Lord, as we, we celebrate this accomplishment, Lord, we thank you for what you've accomplished in him and through him. But, Lord, now we also pray that you anoint him to preach. I pray you give him clarity of mind and clarity of tongue. And, Father, I pray that, that your uh, presence and your power would be evident in this place. Lord, I thank you for our students, and I thank you for this student, John Foster. Bless him now, I ask, in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Amen. Bless you. Thank you, brother. Ooh, well, what a blessing to be here this morning. Uh, I can say that the Lord is here. I felt him through our worship today, through our prayers, and I hope that uh, he will just continue to guide us as we open up his word today. Uh, just a few things I want to open up with is uh, just to, to say I'm thankful for my family that is here today. I'm glad to see them. Uh, my mom and my dad left from Florida yesterday uh, morning, I guess, to head on over here to uh, listen to me speak. So uh, let's just hope they're not disappointed, but... <laughs> I'm just kidding. We're going to go eat a Cracker Barrel afterwards, so they won't be. <laughs> anyway, um, but thankful to have them here. Uh, Mom and Dad, thank you for just pouring into me and just praying for me and just dealing with me and loving on me. And the longer that I'm alive, the more I realize how good parents I do have. I'm very blessed. Right now, I'm serving at a church over in Harlan, Kentucky, and, and uh, under... <coughs> Right now, my pastor, Derek Jeffers, is back there. Glad to have him here. And we've really seen the poverty in the area. We've really seen the challenges that the children in those areas do face. And it makes me more and more thankful for the blessing, not only of the parents that I had, but the easy life that I had. So thank you, Mom and Dad, for being here. I love you very much. And I'm thankful for my mamma and papa. It's my dad's parents that are back here that they came to support me. Thank you for pouring into me. Uh, thank you for praying for me and encouraging me. And, Papa, thank you for this suit that I'm wearing right now. Um, this suit is older than most of the people, well, most of the students in here. It was, it was made in the 70s, and, you know, I'm going to bring it back in style. So, anyway, I just, this is what I wanted to wear, and just in honor of him and just thanking him for all that he's done. Um, I'm thankful for uh, my wife. I'm thankful to be wed to her almost, I guess, four months now. No longer than that, five. She's holding up five fingers, so five months. And uh, what a blessing just to, uh, just to be with her and have her as my partner for life as she's just been an encouragement and a blessing to me. And uh, she's really getting to know me a lot better now. Um, and she's still here, so that's a good sign. Uh, but I'm very thankful for you. I love you, Maddie. Thankful for you as well. I have a lot of friends here, and I'm thankful for your love and encouragement and your support and your prayers and just being the brother and sister in the Lord that I needed, uh, calling me out when I needed to be called out, and uh, just giving me some wisdom when I needed wisdom, and just having fun here on campus as a student. Uh, it's been a blessing, and thank you very much for your friendship. And I know that the friendships, not to be cliche here, but the friendships that we make here, I believe, will last for a whole lifetime. Uh, there are those who've gone on before me uh, as far as when they've graduated, and I still try to keep up connections with them, and I'm sure that I'll continue to, to speak to them. But I'm thankful for my friends. I'm thankful for uh, my, who, my friend, Ryan Martin. He was, he was my pastor. He was my mentor. He was my brother and my boss and all kinds of other things. Uh, but he taught me a lot about prayer. Uh, he taught me a lot about patience, which is still a work in progress. And uh, he just encouraged me and just poured into me. And Ryan, I'm thankful for you. Um, I'm thankful for his encouragement to push me out of my comfort zone to uh, submit to the call of God, which happened, I believe it was October uh, 15th of 2020, I believe, 2020, yeah. It was October 15, 2020, about 2 o'clock in the morning. We were out there in the prayer chapel, me, Ryan, and Corey, and we were praying up a storm, and I got back to my room, and then that's when the Lord laid it on me that he had uh, his calling upon my life to preach his word, to which I ran from for a little while, but uh, Ryan, eventually his sciatic nerve went out, and somebody had to fill the pulpit, so it was kind of thrown to the wolves, you know. But uh, Ryan, I'm thankful for that. I'm glad you're doing better. Uh, and I'm just thankful for, for you as well. Uh, there are many others that I could thank. I am thankful for my professors and uh, just you pouring into me and encouraging me and uh, just being there for me when I need you. 
uh, I just appreciate that a lot. Um, I also thank uh, the staff here for what you do to keep this place running and just to continue to try to glorify God in whatever you do. Thank you very much for all that you do. Uh, and most of all, I want to thank the Lord uh, for everything he's done for me, for saving my soul and, and redeeming me and then bringing me here to Clear Creek Baptist Bible College. What a blessing. I think about this, that when I was in high school, um, I was... I was not exactly a new believer, but I didn't know much about the Bible, and that's, that's, that's my own fault right there is because I wasn't really a student of the Word. But when you come to Clear Creek, you don't really have a choice. Those chapter summaries, amen, you better be a student of the Word. But uh, anyway, I'm, I was just thinking this morning as we were sitting in Old Testament that, well, if I would have known sitting in that seat in that uh, high school that I was going to that I'd be here at Clear Creek and that I'd be getting fed the way that I was, I mean, it's amazing. Uh, you don't know how blessed you are, and I don't realize how blessed I am when I share that with you. So thank you guys very much for all that you do. If you have your Bibles this morning, you could flip over to uh, Mark chapter 6. Mark chapter 6. I'll be preaching about the feeding of the 5,000. We'll be in Mark chapter 6. If you're looking for a title this morning, it's going to be Feasting on the Riches of His grace. Now, that's a pretty fancy title. I didn't come up with that. I actually stole that from a man called Luther B. Bridges. Uh, he was an evangelist and revival speaker back in the, I believe it was the early, late, 18, uh, late 1800s, early 1900s. He had been through some traumatic things in his life. He had lost his family while he was out ministering for the Lord. And when he had come back to find that his family had perished in a fire, he wrote this song. But in that song, one of the verses says, Feasting on the riches of His grace. And so I have a question for you this morning. Are you feasting on the riches of God's grace? If you're here, if you're a believer, if you're sitting here today and you have put your faith in Jesus Christ, I believe you're feasting on the riches of God's grace. I think it's important for us to know the difference between mercy and grace. Mercy is God not giving us what we deserve. We deserve hell. We deserve condemnation. We deserve to be thrown aside. But grace is God giving us what we don't deserve. And thank God for His grace that He gave us what we don't deserve. He gave His only Son, Jesus Christ. And I'm thankful for that, aren't you? Amen. And so, just a little bit of context before we read all 16 verses. Hope you can stand up this long. If not, sit down. But I'm just going to give some context about the book of Mark. So we know that John Mark, he is the author of the book. He was kind of like a disciple of Peter. And Peter just trained him and uh, helped him grow in the Lord. Now, the audience of Mark, it's, it's written to a Roman Christians, a Roman audience. And, and in this book, you'll find that there's no genealogy of Jesus, Jesus or his birth. It just picks up right up at uh, the, the baptism. And so we know that the Romans at this time, they weren't concerned about geolo ge genealogies, excuse me. And uh, the date is said to be around A.D. 65 or so. The key word found in the book of Mark is immediately. And that word can be found in our passage today. The book of Mark has been said to be called an action gospel. I remember that from NT1 as we started out in Mark. I couldn't find my little red notebook that I took those notes in from way back when, uh, but I still remember that to this day. <laughs> I still remember that to this day. I do have it somewhere. It's just probably folded up and put in a closet. But uh, it's, it's not much for uh, a lot of details. Now, there is details in this gospel, but it's not exactly like Matthew or Luke or John. It's more a uh, topical story by story. And so in this gospel, Jesus is pictured as the suffering servant or the perfect slave. And I'm glad that he didn't come to be served. He came to serve, and he came to seek and save that which was lost. Amen. And so just a little bit more background here, context about this passage here, Mark chapter 6. Where we're picking up in verse 30, and we're going to be reading through uh, verses 46. But just to explain what is happening, just setting the scene for what's happening in chapter 6. In the beginning of this chapter, we see that Jesus is not welcome in his hometown. He makes that clear. Seeing how everyone really sees him as just as the son of a carpenter. What's so special about this man, this lowly birth? Well, there was something special about him, and he was more than a carpenter. And so we see that Jesus, in the, in the next uh, part of this uh, chapter 6 here, uh, that 
Jesus commissions his disciples and gives them power over unclean spirits. And furthermore, he sends them only with what they have on in a staff. He says, don't take food, don't take an extra set of clothes. Just take what you got on and grab your staff and just go. And so we also see that uh, John the Baptist and his execution and where and how he was beheaded by King Herod can be found here as well. And King Herod thought he was hearing about Jesus. This is after John has been beheaded. He's hearing about Jesus and he's very interested. As a matter of fact, he thinks that Jesus is John the Baptist resurrected from the dead, but that's not the case here. But we see that Herod wants to see him. Now, let's jump into our text, the feeding of the 5,000. So if you'll stand with me, if you're able, as we read the Word of God, it's holy, it's inspired, it's infallible, there is no error in it. And we're going to be reading verses 30 through 46. And it starts in verse 30 in chapter 6 of Mark. And the apostles gathered themselves together unto Jesus and told him all things, both what they had done and what they had taught. And when he said unto them, Come ye yourselves apart into a desert place and rest a while, for there were coming and going, uh, for there were many coming and going, and they had no leisure so much as to eat. And they departed into a desert place by ship privately. And the people saw them departing, and many knew them, and ran a foot thither out of all cities, and outwent them, and outran them is what that means, and came together unto him. Verse 34 says, And Jesus, when he came out, saw much people, and was moved with compassion toward them, because they were as sheep not having shepherd. They were as sheep as not having a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. Verse 35 says, excuse me, and when the day was now far spent, his disciples came unto him and said, This is a desert place, or a desolate place, and now the time is far past. Send them away that they may go into the country round about into the villages and buy themselves bread, for they have nothing to eat. And he answered and said unto them, Give ye them to eat, or give them something to eat. And uh, he, excuse me, and they say unto him, Shall we go and buy two hundred penny worth of bread? And give them to eat. Now, Pennyworth is King James language, but the translation uh, is denarii, 200 denarius. And so that's what that means. 200 denarius, we're going to talk about how much that was, but it was, uh, it was eight months' wages, is, is how much that was. And that wouldn't even be enough, is what is being said here. But in verse 38, he saith unto them, How many loaves have ye? Go and see. And when they knew, they say, Five and two fishes. So five loaves and two fishes. And he commanded them to make all sit down by companies upon the green grass. And they sat down in ranks by hundreds and fifties. That means they sat in groups of hundreds and fifties. And verse 41 says, And when he had taken the five loaves and the two fishes, he looked up to heaven and blessed and break the loaves and gave them to his disciples to set before them. And the two fishes divided he among them all. And they did all eat and were filled. And they took up twelve baskets full of the fragments and of the fishes. And they that did eat of the loaves were about five thousand men. And verse 45 says, And straightway he constrained his disciples to get into the ship and go to the other side before unto Bethsaida, or Bethsaida, while he sent away the people. And when he had sent them away, he departed into a mountain to pray. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, I just come to you, Lord. I pray that you just calm my stammering tongue. Lord God, I just want to be a mouthpiece for you. I just want to be used by you. God, I know that uh, a lot of us think about this opportunity to come up and preach uh, before our peers and before our friends, that we, we want to have eloquent speech, but God, it's ultimately about glorifying you. It's not about lifting ourselves up. It's not about impressing people, but it's about that your name would be high and lifted up, and God, that you would be exalted today. God, I pray that if there's anybody in here, Lord, who does not know you, Lord God, that you convict them uh, through the worship of your word, uh, God, that they would surrender their lives to you and be saved. God, I just pray right now that if there's any that are here that just are not where they need to be, they're not walking in fellowship with you, God, that, that today they can, they can have that made right. And God, I love you and praise you. Hide me behind your cross. To you be the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. 
So that's a lot of verses that we just covered. Uh, we just went through 16 verses of Scripture. There's a lot going on here. I'm not going to be able to do the whole passage justice, but I'm going to do the best that I can. And so as I'm sharing this with you, as we look in verse 31, Jesus tells his disciples to come to a secluded place and rest a while. I'm paraphrasing what's happening in these verses, but we're going verse by verse here. He's telling them to come to a secluded place, a, a desert place or a desolate place, and rest a while. Maybe some time to pray. Maybe some time to just get away from the people and just take it easy. Just get some physical rest, spiritual rest. For there were lots of people, and they didn't even have time to eat. Now, as a Baptist, I know that I get quite hungry, and when I get hungry, I get what they call hangry. And so it is kind of hard to think about others, and it is hard to think about helping others when you want to help yourself. Just real quick, I remember as I was first getting started over at Atlantis Hill Baptist Church in Hancock County, Tennessee, I wasn't surrendered to preach yet, but I just started doing music out there, leading the, the music. And there was this old lady, her name was Dorothy, and she came up to me, and it just seemed like every time I, I got down from the pulpit after singing, she would want me to learn a, a new song. And so she would set her binder in front of me and says, can you read this? No, I cannot. I don't know how to read music. I'm learning how. And she just sat me at the piano and expected me to play it, and I couldn't do it. And I remember that it was getting quite late. And this is after church, and my stomach begins to growl. And I'm thinking, buddy, I, I'm, I'm really hungry right now, and, and I know what's waiting on the other side of these doors in this church. We're going to Ryan's mom's house. She's going to have fried chicken, mashed potatoes, green beans, rolls, the whole nine yards. And the only person who's standing between me and that meal is this little woman right here. Love her heart. Great woman. But... I, that, that's just to, to tell you that, you know, we're thinking about ourselves here. That, but anyway, they didn't even have time to eat. Verse 32, it says, They got into a boat and went to a secluded place by themselves. So they're going off to a secluded place. And verse 33 says, The people saw them going and they ran ahead of them by land. Now, just think about this, that, Jesus is wanting them to rest. He's wanting them to pray, just to, to take it easy, to kind of, you know, you guys have been quite busy. You've been doing the work. You've reported to me uh, what's been happening and the miracles that you've, that you've been doing that I commissioned you to do. Let's get some rest here. And the people are just swamping them. They're just coming all around them. You know, they're just, they're coming in by the dozens and by the hundreds. Sometimes ministry can cost you time to yourself. Sometimes ministry can cost you time with your family. Now, we've heard this before that we don't need to sacrifice our families on the altar of ministry. Dr. Smith says that uh, in class. But sometimes the unexpected happens and we have to answer the call. Whether that might be to go pray with somebody in a hospital at 3 o'clock in the morning, whether that's to preach a funeral or whether that's to fill in for somebody, sometimes... Ministry costs something, but we have to do what God tells us to do. And so Jesus sees this, and he, he knew what was going to happen before any of this took place. He knew it when he was laying the foundation of the world, what was going to happen, that they wouldn't reach first off that secluded place to pray and take it easy, that they were about to be interrupted by more than 5,000 people who were hungry. And so sometimes ministry can cost you time. It can cost you sometimes time with the Lord, that personal time. But we're getting ready to see towards the end that after the miracle, Jesus still goes and spends time with his Father. Amen. That's important. We can get caught up in ministry, but we have to make sure that we're setting aside time to study God's Word, to pray to Him, and let Him pour into us. If we're not being poured into, then there's nothing good that we can pour out. Amen. We have to be poured into. And so verse 34, by the time they reach the shore, all the people are waiting on them. But here's the thing. Instead of being angered or forcing the crowds away, Jesus could have snapped his fingers. He wouldn't even have to snap. He could just thought in his head, man, I wish they would go away. And they could have, but he didn't. This was an opportunity to teach his disciples a lesson. This was an opportunity to show what his ministry was really about, that he was going to be a servant. He was going to put the people before himself. And so instead of being angered or forcing the crowds away, Jesus 
felt compassion for them, it says. Something that's important is before Jesus feeds them physically, he feeds them spiritually. Priorities are straight here in the life of Jesus and in his ministry. Sometimes I know that I've been to some churches where they eat and then they have a singing or a preaching. And, you know, that's fine and dandy. Some people can fall asleep after they eat. You know, I know I have a one o'clock class after lunch. And if I eat those soup, beans, cornbread on that wonderful Thursday that we had last week, it's hard for me to stay awake. But priorities, Jesus needs to come first. We need to be feasting on his word first off before we can be feasting on actual bread. We need to be feasting on the bread of life. Amen. So Jesus taught before feeding them. So the word compassion here is found as a noun 11 times in the New Testament. But here it's an active verb and it occurs 12 times in the Gospels. And so it means the seed of the emotions. It's beyond ordinary feelings. It's a messianic compassion. And so thinking about this, that, you know, when I looked up this word, I was talking to Jared about this. We kind of had a laugh that there's, there's two different meanings. One, the, the unbiblical term for um, compassion talks about a stirring within your stomach, you know, within the bowels. But that's not what's being said here. This is a messianic compassion. Jesus didn't need Tums or Alka-Seltzer. So anyway, that being said, we're talking about the seed of the emotions. In verse 35... We noticed that it was quite late, and the disciples then came and said, This place is desolate, and it's getting late. So guess what? We've not eaten. We've been out here all day, and it's starting to get kind of dark. And I'm, you know, send them away. Send them away that we might rest. Verse 36. Then they say, Lord, send them away, that they may go into the surrounding area and villages and find them something to eat. But verse 37 in John 6, 5, you'll find the feeding of the 5,000 in John chapter 6. But John 6, 5 states that when Jesus says, you give them something to eat, he's talking to Philip. He's talking to his disciple Philip here. It said that uh, Philip was actually from that surrounding area. So if it was anybody who knew where to get something to eat, it was Philip. And so Jesus asks Philip, you give them something to eat. And Philip answers that, not even 200 denarii or eight months' wages is what that is, would not be enough to feed them. It is in Matthew's account that we learn there are children and women as well. It's not just 5,000 men. We're told in Matthew's account that there is women, children, and men. So I wouldn't say that all of them had wives and children, but a lot of them did. And so we can probably guesstimate a little bit more than 15,000 maybe around that number, something like that. I mean, if it was one wife, one kid, but it was definitely more than 5,000 people that were being fed here. And so verse 38 says, And Jesus sent them out to see what could be found. He's getting his disciples to go out to look around, see what they can scrape up. And it was five loaves and two fishes. And so we see in verses 39 through 40 that Jesus, he then has his disciples to tell all the people to sit down. Now I was reading one commentary and said, you know, it probably took a lot of faith for, for his disciples to get all the people to sit down. Meanwhile, what they're looking at behind them is five loaves and two fish. I mean, you're about to feed more than 5,000 people off five loaves and two fish. It takes faith, but they had to be obedient, and they were. And so they had the people sit down in groups of 50s and 100s. And so then, in verse 41, And he, which is being Jesus, took the loaves and the fish, and he blessed it and broke it. Other translations in, in other areas where this text can be found is that he gave thanks. And so he gave thanks for this small meal that seemed insignificant. The word gave thanks found in these accounts refer to praise or extol or bless, praising God. I don't know what Jesus' exact prayer is, but Jesus knew what the outcome would be. And so he kept giving out the fish and the loaves to set before the people and divided it up among all the people. Verse 42 says, and they all were satisfied in full. So look, they didn't get fragments. They didn't get crumbs. They didn't get just a little bit, but they had all they needed. And guess what? We're getting ready to find out that there was 12 baskets more taken up. So he's going above and beyond. He's not just supplying their needs, but he's looking ahead of time. 
Amen. He looks ahead of time for us. He does not just give us what we need, even though his word tells us in Philippians 4.19, For my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory. Amen. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills is what his word says. And I know that Psalm, I think it's Psalms 37.25 that says, I've never seen the righteous forsaken nor his children begging for bread. Amen. He's going to take care of us. There's more than we need. And so we see that verse 43 says, 12 baskets were picked up as leftovers. And some commentators say that there was a basket each for each disciple, but I'm not 100% sure about that. But we do know that there was plenty of leftovers. Verse 44 uh, says, you know, although in Mark's gospel, 5,000 men, we do know once again that there were more than double that number because it does say in this account that there was 5,000. Verse 45, here it is, the key word in Mark's gospel immediately is found right here. So he constrained or he compelled his disciples to get into the boat. After the miracle was over, he says, you guys get in the boat and go to the other side. He compelled his disciples to get into the boat and go ahead of him to the other side of Bethsaida. And while he was sending the crowd away, it's right here if we read in John's account that we find out that the people after this miracle, they're all hyped up and they're ready to get Jesus to be king. They want to be freed from that Roman oppression. You know, they want an earthly king, but Jesus had a duty to do. And he was going to the cross, and nothing could stop him from reaching the cross, amen? Because not only was he going to be king over all the earth, but he was going to be king in the heavens as well. And I'm thankful that he didn't stop and decide to be king down here, because if he didn't, I'd be condemned. But he decided that he was going to go all the way, amen? I'm thankful for that. So John's account shows us that the people were ready to force Jesus to be their king if necessary. And some commentators say that he sent his disciples away so they wouldn't be impacted negatively, that they might fall into the desires of the crowd, you know, that they might get kind of confused and kind of hyped up and say, well, you know, maybe we just need to join the majority here and just have Jesus be our king. And so he sends them away. So in verse 46, after bidding them farewell, he left for the mountain to pray. We see that Jesus, he's still prioritizing. Even though there was a distraction, Jesus used this opportunity to minister to the people, to be that servant, that suffering servant that Mark's gospel shows us that he is. But he's still going to the Father to spend time with him. Sometimes, like I said, we get distracted. A lot of things happen in our life where we can't have that quiet time when we usually want it. But we can always have that quiet time. And I, and I say that to myself. It's, it's, it's convicting for me to say it, but there's always time for Jesus. Amen. Always time for Jesus. And so he was going to spend time with the Father. There's three truths that I, I dragged from this text. And, and, it's, and we've realized that uh, there's more miracles that cover multiplication that are found in Scripture. We know that in Mark chapter 8 that we see the feeding of the 4,000. And we know that in 2 Kings chapter 4 we see the multiplication of the oil. We know that there was a widow woman and Elisha goes under her and she is just in a real pickle. She's going to have her sons taken away and she doesn't have any money. And so uh, God sends his word through the man of God and says, Hey, gather up all these pots in the surrounding area and get them together. And take what you have and keep pouring it out. And eventually, all the pots they had were full. And she was able to pay off that debt. But three truths here. In this passage, we see that God's people have a need. Now, they were hungry. That's true. They had a physical need that needed to be met. They had been with Jesus a day. And the feeding of the 4,000, they had been with Jesus three days. But they had a physical need. But moreover, they had a spiritual need. They needed to be fed spiritually. Not, now listen to this. Just because these 5,000 plus people were following Jesus does not mean that they knew Jesus. That doesn't mean that they had a relationship with him. They were following him. A lot of them were following him because of his miracles, because of his speech, just because of things that he was doing. But I remember Brother Derek back there, he was preaching this text. We're not supposed to be following Jesus for what he's doing, but because of who he is because of who he is. So we see that God's people have a need. We also see that Jesus had compassion when he didn't even have to. He didn't have to have compassion, but he did, and thankful for that. And so we see as a third point that he acted and supplied their need abundantly. 
He didn't just supply just so they had enough, but they had more than enough. And I just want to ask you this question as we're finishing up here. Has God not done so in our lives? Let me listen to this. That we have a need, a spiritual need, that we need a Savior, that we need to put our faith, that we need to be born again. We have a need to be saved. And didn't God have compassion, as John 3, 16 tells us, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever, I love that word, whosoever, it doesn't matter where you're from, it doesn't matter who you are, it doesn't matter what you've done, he doesn't care. It's whosoever gospel. That whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life or eternal life. Listen to this. It goes a little bit further. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. He didn't come down here to tell us how bad we all were. We already knew. But that the world through him might be saved. He who believes, this is believing in Jesus. He who believes in Jesus is not condemned. But he who does not believe is condemned already because he's not believed the name of the only begotten son of God. But Jesus had compassion. God had compassion on our behalf. He saw us down here in the mire of sin with no hope. I think about that scripture, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Another verse that can be found in scripture is Christ died for the ungodly. Our righteousness is filthy rags. You look that up, what that really means. It's something I'm not very comfortable talking about. But it's pretty nasty, if you ask me. And so God had compassion on us. And not only did he supply our need, not only did he give us purpose and life on this earth and a ministry and responsibility and friends and family, but he gave us something even better, eternal life through him. That our hope is not found here in this earth, but it's found in Jesus Christ. That's that song we sang, on Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. And so we see that we had a need of salvation. And I just want to ask you here, there might be somebody here listening today, maybe online or maybe in this sanctuary, who's not given their lives to Jesus. I want to say that you're not going to have any hope. You're not going to have any purpose. You're not going to have any will to live without a Savior in your life. He's the one who gives you life and life eternal. He gives you purpose. We know that the Roman roads, you know, for all is sin and fall short of the glory of God. We've all messed up. We, homardiology is the doctrine of sin. We study that in Christian theology. It's missing the mark. We couldn't do it. We messed it up. And we know that the wages of sin is death. It's death. Not just death earthly, but it's eternal death. It's going to hell. But, listen here, the gift, grace here, God's grace, Jesus Christ, the gift of grace is eternal life. And so we see that God's undeserving compassion. He gives it to us. He sends His Son. He supplies our need. And as for believers, He sends us to the other side. I, I just encourage you, if you don't know the Lord today, that you would put your trust in Him. Only trust Him. Only trust Him. Only trust Him now. And immediately, He will save you. He will save you. He will save you now. It's not next week. It's not tomorrow. And don't wait for tomorrow. But I know that I'm speaking to probably one of the most educated congregations I'll ever preach to. But I know that there are those who are struggling. I know that there are those who are dealing with the weight of loss and, and sickness. And there's a lot of oppression here on campus. I know that we can all say that. We met together last night and we vocalized that, that there's oppression here. Satan wants to stop the gospel ministry because we have the words of life to share with the lost and dying world. And so I just ask you, even though if you're a believer, are you feasting on the riches of His grace? Are you walking in the light of the Lord? I'm going to have Miss Ruth come up here, and she's going to play the piano softly. And I just want you guys to know that you can come up here and pray any burdens that are bothering you, that are pulling you down, that you need to lay down. You can do it. And guess what? You don't even have to come up here if you don't want to. I just want you to know that this opportunity is available now. I'm not, I'm not God or anything. I can't make you repent or I can't make things better for you, but I know someone who can. And so I ask that you please just join us in this time of invitation. I'm going to pray for us. Lord God, I just want to thank you for your word. I thank you that you are sufficient. God, I praise you for giving me the strength to share with your people your word. God, I pray that if there's any here who do not know you, God, they would surrender to you. 
God, I pray for those who are out of fellowship, God, that you would just draw them back unto you. You are our joy, you are our life, and you are our crown, Lord Jesus. We pray right now that your, your spirit of peace would be felt, that you'd be healing and moving in a way that you see fit. To you be the glory. In Jesus' name, amen.